Good morning. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you would simply come and move in and through our hearts and our minds and teach us about the Father. Would you bring your word alive here in this room this morning like never before? For we pray it in Jesus' name, the storyteller. Amen. Well, our text this morning and next week is the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Many have called this chapter the Gospel within the Gospel, and rightly so. For in the 15th chapter, we have good news in pure form, especially in the parable of the father and his lost sons. Now, many of us in this room have heard this parable many, many times and yet long to hear it again. And many of us in this room have preached it or taught it or shared it with somebody and long to do that again. It was 1998 when I first heard a Southern California preacher by the name of Daryl Johnson share and preach this parable in the context that I'm gonna offer it to you this morning. I had never heard anything like it. I got up at the end of the service, I went out to the lobby, and I stood in line to purchase the cassette tape, if anyone remembers those days. I've made it my discipline for the past 21 years to listen to that cassette tape at least one time a year. And it's that, that sermon that I offer to you this morning. Now, Jesus, his story has redemptive effect in any cultural setting. But the story really comes alive and does its transformative work in us when we hear it in the original cultural context in which Jesus taught it, and that is in a Middle Eastern context. Ready? Luke 15, verse 1. Hear the word of God. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble or murmur, saying, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. So Jesus goes on to tell them a parable. He tells them the parables of the shepherd and the lost sheep, the woman and the lost coin, and the father and the lost sons. Whenever we read Jesus' story, we have to first remember that he first told this story to scribes and to Pharisees. It's told for the benefit of scribes and Pharisees. And we need to remember that Jesus tells this story to justify his actions, to justify his behavior, which the scribes and the Pharisees have judged to be scandalous. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. He tells the story to justify his actions, which the Pharisees and the scribes have judged to be shameful. They've judged to be scandalous. Now, who are these scribes and Pharisees that Jesus always seems to be in conflict with? The scribes are the professional theologians of the day. The scribes are the seminary professors and the ecclesiastical lawyers. They are the, what we'd call the Baptist executives and the district superintendents. They're entrusted with the task of teaching and protecting the law of God and all the oral tradition associated with it. It is incumbent upon their office to interrogate Jesus about his teaching. The Pharisees, they were the lay leaders of the day, the devout, devout lay leaders of the day. They're the elders and the deacons, the ushers, the Sunday school teachers, and they were committed to obeying the law of God and the 631 additional regulations that were attached to the original 10 commandments. Now, although the scribes and the Pharisees, I know we give them bad press in the gospels, we can't quickly dismiss their concern. They were well-motivated people. They wanted to be holy. They wanted to be pleasing to God. They wanted to help others be holy and be pleasing to God. They wanted to bring Israel before God and be holy and pleasing. But their problem was their concept of holiness. 
for scribes and Pharisees, holiness meant keeping the rules, keeping the regulations. For them, holiness meant conformity to the rules, conformity to the regulations. One achieves holiness by keeping rules and regulations, and by that, they miss the point. Holiness cannot be legislated. Holiness comes from a relationship. Holiness comes from a relationship to a holy God, and that relationship cannot be achieved or maintained by rules and regulations. Now, here's a crucial point we must keep in mind whenever we read Jesus' story. The scribes and the Pharisees thought of themselves as the protectors of Israel's law. The scribes and Pharisees saw themselves as the protectors of the reputation of Israel's God. That is crucial to remember. They were the protectors of the reputation of Israel's God. And as far as the scribes and Pharisees are concerned, Jesus of Nazareth is shaming that reputation. Jesus of Nazareth is shaming the name of a holy God. At, at stake in this story is the character of of the living God. Now, who are these sinners and tax collectors that Jesus always seems to be in company with? Well, the tax collectors were Jews working for the Romans. You know that they would buy the rights to collect tax, and as long as they returned the agreed upon amount, they could charge any additional tax that they could dream of. And so, in essence, they were ripping off their own countrymen. The word sinners is the Pharisees' word. You know Jesus never addressed a human being using the word sinner. It refers to people who broke the law. Such people were unclean and they were ostracized by the people that thought they were keeping the law. Sinners and tax collectors simply flocked to Jesus. They could tell that there was something different about this rabbi. They wanted to be near Jesus. Luke seems to stress that more than any other gospel writer, that sinners and tax collectors wanted to be near Jesus. And the horrifying scandal for the scribes and Pharisees is it seemed like Jesus wanted to be near them. Luke says Jesus received them. He welcomed them. The word Luke uses literally means to welcome into the web of one's family, to welcome as one's own family member. But the really, really horrifying thing for the scribes and Pharisees was that Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. He ate with them. Now in the Middle East, to have a meal with someone means something very different in our culture. To have a meal with someone in the Middle East is a sacramental act which signifies total acceptance. A sacramental act which signifies total acceptance. Scandal of scandals, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. The scribes and Pharisees say it with disgust. They say it with anger because Jesus is shaming the reputation of Israel's law. And worse than that, Jesus is shaming the name of Israel's God. Shame, shame, shame. So Jesus responds to that accusation by telling the three parables recorded in Luke 15. They're often called the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. And it's really too bad because the subject of the stories is not who or what is lost, but whose is lost. The emphasis is not on the lost sheep, but on the shepherd. It's not on the lost coin, but it's on the woman. And it's not on the lost sons, but it's on the father. And here's the most important point we need to remember as we look into the story. Through these parables, Jesus is painting a portrait. Jesus, the theologian, Jesus, the artist, is painting a portrait of the living God whose reputation the scribes and Pharisees are zealous to protect. Here we have God in the flesh, the one who can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, now painting a portrait of the Father. 
He paints a portrait of the Father so he can invite us into the Father's heart. And that explains why these parables over time have such powerful effect on human lives. Why they are so powerfully transforming in the feelings of the shepherd for the sheep, in his actions towards the sheep, in his feelings of in the feelings of the woman towards her coin, in her actions towards those coin, and in the feelings of the father and his action towards his sons, we discover what the what the father is like and who the father is. It's so important to grasp. The subject of these stories is the Holy One whose reputation the scribes and the Pharisees are just anxious to protect. Now, one last thing before we get going. The fact of the matter is that through the telling of these stories, Jesus just heightens the scandal. He was in trouble before he told the stories. We're gonna find out what kind of trouble he's in after he tells the stories. Let me show you why. And I think you could follow along in your insert there. Luke 15, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. Two sons. This tells me that we will miss the message of the story if we only focus on one son. The fact of the matter is the parable is told for the benefit of the second son. Both sons, it turns out, leave their father. The younger one while going off to the far country, the older one while staying home. The younger son says to his father, verse 12, Father, give me my share of the estate which falls to me. What a cruel thing to say. It's as though he says, Father, let's just pretend that you have died and you give me my cut that I will get when you do die. Dr. Kenneth Bailey, who was a missionary in the Middle East, who spent most of his life in Lebanon and Syria, in his book, The Cross and the Prodigal, points out that such a request is unheard of in the Middle East. He writes, indeed, this request is impossible to have heard. Dr. Bailey says he's tested this out through the villages of the Middle East, asking villagers, has anyone ever made this request in your village? And the answer is always no. Then he would ask, if someone did make this request, what would happen? And the answer is always, while the father would beat him, of course. And he asks, why? And they say, because the request means he wants the father to die. What a selfish, demanding, rebellious, ungrateful kid. Father, give me. It's the keynote of his conversation with his father. Father, give me my share of the estate. Now here we learn a basic uh, thing about the nature of sin. Sin is not breaking the rules. Although that is involved, sin is breaking relationship. At the beginning of the story, the son does not break any rules. However, he does break his father's heart. And next week, we'll look at the older son who doesn't break any rules, but also breaks his father's heart. Now, how does this father respond to the young, man, young man's request for the estate? Well, in a surprising way. As Middle Eastern villagers told Dr. Bailey, the father is expected to beat the son. But what does the father portrayed by Jesus do? Verse 12, he grants the request. He divides the wealth between them. The father gives the son one-third of the family estate, one third, and lets the son go. This tells us something about the love of God, that the love of God is not possessive. Love gives the freedom to refuse to be loved. There are times where God lets us have our way. There's another surprise in the father's response. At this point, Middle Eastern villagers expect the father to say something like, okay, Go your way, but you are no longer my son. That's what the villagers expect him to say, but this father does not say that. And in so doing so, chooses to suffer more deeply in opening himself up for even greater pain. I don't have high school students. I mean, I don't have high school kids. My kids are still middle school and, and younger, but I'm told that that is much the experience of parents with high schoolers. 
When they walk out the door, you want to say, fine, then just don't come back. (laughs) But you don't. You keep your mouth shut and choose to suffer even deeper. Remember, Jesus is painting a picture of the living God. He's painting a picture of the living God whose reputation the scribes and the Pharisees are zealous to protect. So the younger son gathers all that he has and sets off for the far country. The word translated gathered together in verse 13 should literally be rendered turned into cash. He liquidates his assets to travel more lightly. He goes from house to house, shop to shop, selling off one third of the family estate. Now notice how Jesus says the son does this quickly. Verse 13, not many days later, Jesus says. The reason for the haste isn't that the son wants to just get on with his journey, but rather, as Dr. Bailey suggests, as the son goes from one prospective buyer to the next, the intensity of the community hatred and disgust mounts. Around every turn, he's greeted with amazement and horror and rejection. Shame, shame, shame. And he needs to leave the village very quickly for his own safety. Now, this part of the cultural context will play a huge part of the story in a few minutes. So the son leaves and he goes off to the far country, far from his own people, and he squanders one third of the family wealth in loose living. Loose living is a biblical euphemism for wine, women, and song. The son lives so loosely, Jesus says, that he loses everything one-third of the family wealth, and then a famine hits. It has been said, thank God it does not go well in the far country. (laughs) Thank God it does not go well when God lets us have our way. When the son had lots of money, he had lots of friends. Now that he has no money, he has no friends, and he becomes in need. Why not go home? He does go home later on in the story, but why not at this point go home? Well, for one, he's afraid to go home. He'll have to meet the taunting and the jesting of the villagers when he comes home. As he comes through the village gates, he'll have to deal with, ha ha, so you went off to live the good life, huh? Now look at you, you're dirty, you're miserable, you're a total failure. And I think he just can't at this point contemplate enduring such shame. Furthermore, he doesn't go home because he's gonna have to deal with the village elders, the anger and the hostility of the elders. They might beat him. They might make it so miserable for him that they would starve him. Dr. Bailey asks Middle Eastern villagers, what would you do if a son ran off with the wealth and then came back? They said, well, we would starve him, of course. And if we didn't starve him, we would beat him. Furthermore, the son doesn't go home because he doesn't want to or endure the scorn of the older brother. The older brother might say something like, you lousy good-for-nothing bum. You wasted one-third of our family's wealth. You have no right to be here. Or if the brother had some sort of mercy, he'd probably say something like, you blew it. You screwed up. Now go get it back. And once you get it back, then you can come home. But there's another reason that the son stays in the far country, and that is his father. He fully expects the anger, the scorn, the punishment, and the rejection of his father. His father has every right to feel that way, does he not? He has every right to say, look, you made your bed, sleep in it. So the son decides to stay in the far country. He goes from one citizen, he goes to one citizen, a Gentile in that country, and in Luke 15, 15, it says he begs for work. Now, interesting enough, uh, the, the word says he attached himself. It literally means he glued himself to this citizen. He is so desperate that he forces himself upon this citizen and begs for work. Jesus says that it's most likely that the citizen uh, said, sure, kid, to this Jewish boy, why don't you go feed the pigs just to get rid of him? And he'd rather take that job than go home. The situation worsens. 
He would gladly, Jesus says, eaten what the pigs were eating, but no one would even offer him pig food. So then in verse 17, Jesus says, the son comes to his senses. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread and I am here starving? Question I wanna ask is, what made this young man come to his senses? His need, partly, yes. But scholar Dale Bruner helps us see a deeper reason. Dr. Bruner says, what brought this young man to his senses was the memory of his father. He remembers the goodness of the father. How many of my father's hired men have enough bread? And I am here starving. He remembers that his father treated his servants generously. What a reputation. So the younger son reasons to himself and says, what am I doing here? I will get up, I will go home and ask to be a hired hand. I will face the taunting, the scorn, the rejection, but at least I will not starve. So he gets up dirty, rugged, weary, broke, and he heads for home. And on his way home, he puts together a speech. Remember those days when you did something and you were heading home and you had to face the music? He puts together a speech. It has three parts. It's in verse 18 and 19. And I can only imagine him running over and over in his head this speech. Part one, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Part one is his confession of sin. He knows he was wrong. Part two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Part two is his affirmation of the consequences of sin. He knows he shamed the father. He knows he shamed the brother. He knows he shamed the village. He knows he has broken relationship and he has no more claim or right to sonship. Part three, make me to be one of your hired men. Part three is his offer to make up for his sin, to pay off his debt. So let's review the speech, part one. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Part two, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And part three, make me to be one of your hired men. And now we come to the heart of the story. Remember why Jesus is telling the story. Remember why. He's telling it to justify his actions. He's interpreting his behavior, which the scribes and the Pharisees consider to be scandalous. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And Jesus tells this story to justify his behavior. At this point in the story, the scribes and the Pharisees are listening to Jesus very, very carefully as he paints a picture of the living God. Jesus says in verse 20, But while the son was a long way off, yes, Jesus, but while the son was a long way off, yes, Jesus, while the son was a long way off, his father saw him. Surprise. Everyone in that day expected the father to have forgotten the son, to have gotten lost in his business. No, but this father has been waiting for his son, been longing for his son, been looking for his son. This is the picture of the living God that Jesus is painting. While the son was a long way off, the father saw him. Do you know that the Father sees you? Do you know that the Father sees maybe some of your children or your grandchildren who are off in the far country? Jesus continues, verse 20, and he felt compassion, another surprise. Everyone in the Middle Eastern context expects scorn, disgust, indignation. The kid blew it. He just wouldn't listen to me. He hasn't listened to me since the day he was born. He wanted to have his way, let him have his way. But not this father. This father feels compassion. The word Luke uses is a strong word. It's 
too loosely, it's too weakly translated compassion. It's the word splankna. It's the word that describes the guts, the inward parts. The father is deeply moved. He's ripped up in his guts for his son. What a picture of the living God Jesus is painting here. He's painting the picture of a suffering father. Jesus continues in verse 20. And the father ran to his son. <laughs> Another surprise. In the Middle East, a man of the father's age and stature never runs for any reason. To run in public is a shameful thing to do. In order to run, he would have to lift up the front hem of his robes, exposing his undergarments. A shameful act. The father ran. Literally, Jesus says, the father raced. The father raced towards his son. What a picture of the living God Jesus is painting here. You have to ask yourself, do you see him racing towards you? Do you see him running towards you or towards your children or your grandchildren? Why run? Well, he longs to see his son, right? He also runs, and here's where the cultural context comes into play and is so critical. He runs because the father knows what the son is about to face as he enters the village gates. The father knows the son will be heckled. He'll be humiliated. And he runs to head it off. It's a shameful act. Jesus continues in verse 20. And the father embraced him and put his arms around him and kissed him, literally kept kissing him again and again and again. What a scandalous picture Jesus is painting for us. The father should have remained back in the house. The father should have remained cool at the arrival of this son who squandered one third of the family wealth, who shamed the name of the family, who shamed the name of the village. But Jesus knows a different kind of father. The father's been longing. He's been waiting. He's been suffering. And when he saw his son, he ran and threw his arms around him and kissed him, dirty though he may be. And by that act, the father takes upon all the shame of the son upon himself. In embracing the son and in kissing the son, the father has taken all the shame of the son and transferred it onto himself. And whatever it was that the village elders and the older son, were, older brother were going to do to the son, they must now do to the father. While stunned at this amazing, scandalous, shameful act, the son starts his speech. Remember, it has three parts. Verse 21, Father, I've sinned, against, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. The Father lets the Son say part one. It's redemptive. God will always let us confess our sin. It clears the air. Part two, the Son continues, I'm no longer worthy to be called your Son. And the Father lets him say part two. It's very important. It must be said. It means he knows how damaging sin is and that he has broken the relationship. And there's a third part. Remember what it is? Make me to be one of your hired men. And so the son takes a deep breath. But before he can say part three, the father surprises him again and interrupts the son with his own speech. That interruption is the gospel. That interruption is the good, new, the good news. The father cuts off part three of the son's speech. He will not hear it. Sure, we can say it until we're blue in the face, but it's irrelevant. God will not let us try to make up for our sin. God will not let us try to pay off the debt. Oh, sure, we, we try it all the time, don't we? God will not let us try and earn our way back into the family. The father interrupts the son before he can give part three because there is nothing the son can do but come home. That's all he can do, just come home. All God wants is us to come to our senses, turn around, 
and come home. I said part three of the speech, the son's speech is cut off by the father's speech and everything the father says in his speech is full of surprises. Everyone expects the father to say something like, all right, kid, go get a shower and put on some clean clothes. But not this father. Verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. The best robe? Think for a minute. He's saying this to scribes and to Pharisees who are anxious to protect the reputation of Israel's God. And here this rabbi, this young Jesus, is painting a picture of the living God whose reputation they are anxious to protect. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. The best robe? The best robe is the father's robe. You mean to tell me the prodigal son is going to enter the village and enter a big party wearing the father's robe? What a picture Jesus is painting. The father dresses the prodigal son. The living God clothes unholy sinners with his holiness. He clothes our rags with his robe. There's more. Quick, put a ring on his finger. This ring is the so-called signet ring. It's what the father uses to seal all his official documents. You mean to tell me, Jesus, the kid who squandered one-third of the wealth is now gonna be put in charge of the rest of your wealth? You see the scandal in that? You mean to tell me, Jesus, sinners are gonna be leaders in the kingdom of God? Tax collectors are gonna be in, char in, in charge of the church? There's more. Quick, put sandals on his feet. Slaves went barefoot. Sons and daughters wore shoes. Quick, bring the fattened calf and kill it. The fattened calf is reserved for the most honored guest. The highest honor that could be shown in the Middle East is to butcher a calf for somebody. Sinners and tax collectors worth butchering a calf? Honored guests at the meal of the holy God? Quick, let's have a feast and celebrate this son of mine was dead and now alive was lost and now is found. Jesus here is revealing a rejoicing father, a feast-making father who celebrates the homecoming of sinners. Everything the father does in this story is unexpected and scandalous in that culture just like everything Jesus does with sinners is unexpected and scandalous. Jesus defends his scandalous actions by an even more scandalous claim that in him, the Holy One, God the Father is welcoming sinners and eating with them. In Jesus, the Holy One embraces sinners. It's the embrace that makes us holy. The Holy One risks his reputation in order to embrace sinners. It's scandalous love. This is the one who only acts in a way that brings honor to his name. In a few minutes, we're gonna move to the communion table where Jesus eats with sinners and tax collectors. And here is the good news of this meal. Here is the good news. The good news that every human being on this planet longs to hear. That in the incarnation, the living and holy God lifts the hem of his robe and runs towards lost sons and daughters. And at the cross, the living and holy God takes upon himself all the shame of the unholy. That is the good news. It is safe to come home. 
It matters not what you've done or not done since the last time you've heard this parable. It matters not what you've done or not done since the last time maybe you taught or shared this parable. Just turn around and come home, Jesus says. Just come home. Oh, sure, we're gonna learn next week there might be a few older brothers and sisters that are gonna heckle us. There's gonna be a few older brothers and sisters that are gonna demand we measure up first. But that's just because they don't know the Father's heart yet. Besides, there's only one opinion that matters, and that's the opinion of the Father. And the only begotten Son of the Father, Jesus Christ, is telling us this morning, it is safe to come home. In thinking about communion, why do you think the son dies in the posture that he does with his arms outstretched? The outstretched arms are the outstretched arms of the father. I tell you, says Jesus, it is safe to come home. The Father's heart is open wide towards sinners and he will embrace you and he will embrace us with scandalous love. Let's pray. Father, I pray that maybe one day we will truly believe Jesus and his story of how much you love us. For we pray it in the storyteller's name, Jesus, amen.